Um, we're really pleased on behalf of the PSB uh, Collection Advisory Board um, that everybody's able to join us. Um, we were talking earlier at breakfast that the, uh, this is a stimulating conference, but mentally exhausting because you're thinking all the time, um, and particularly how you can use Pearl's work and legacy in your own life. Um, and um, I'm excited for, this is odd to be excited, right? PSB War and Accountability. Uh, seems like one should not be excited by that. Um, but it's really exciting to hear about how we can learn from Pearl for what's going on in our current situation in our current world. Um, so I'm pleased this morning uh, to welcome Dr. David Crow from Chapman University. Well, let me second. <clears throat> well, let me second. What a wonderful conference has been. Incredibly stimulating and. Uh, very educational. I particularly like the interaction with the Chinese colleagues because they bring perspectives that Pearl would understand, but other people might not. Um, the my interest in Pearl Buck goes back decades. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the Life Life magazine articles and things like that. And she was also when I was in graduate school doing Chinese and Russian studies. Uh, she was one of what we call the old China hands. You know, Ed Snow. Uh, some of the other people that, that were known as the Chinese experts. And um, I remember when I made my first of three trips to China in the mid to late 80s, I was worried that the China of Pearl Buck or Red Snow had disappeared. Uh, fortunately for me, it hadn't because they were still farming by hand and no tractors. It was uh, now China, the face of China is changing dramatically in, uh, in the midst of this rapid industrialization and things like that. So I'm really pleased I got to see the China of Earl Park and I certainly, you cannot. I'm saying, is that a mic right there? Yeah, he said, is it not working? Uh, it's not a room microphone, it's just for the recording. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So am I not loud enough? Um, so maybe speak up just a little bit. So okay, all right. <laughs> My students complain about that all the time. <laughs> all right, so I'm, I'm glad that I was able to see the China of Earl Buck because, uh, as I said, it's disappearing now. And uh, I understand her works and so forth much better as a result of having spent so much time in, in, in China over the last 30 plus years. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about Pearl Buck's universal voice. Uh, most of us know her through, her through her novels and things like that. But she also was an incredible activist. Uh, civil rights, uh, when uh, President Roosevelt uh, decided to intern the Japanese, one of the first people to write him was Pearl Buck, who strongly objected to, uh, to this internment policy. So she, there was, and there'll be some things in Dragon City that I'll read to you, uh, but understand that when she's talking about Japanese crimes, for example, in China, uh, that she, it doesn't have an anti-Japanese tone because she was not prejudicial towards Asians. I, my, this particular topic, about a number of, several years ago I published a book called War Crimes, Genocide, and Justice, a big book on just that topic. A great deal of it deals with Asia. And as I was doing research first in Jew, major Jewish archives with Lemkin's files in, uh, in Cincinnati, I kept coming across the name Pearl Buck. I said, hmm, that's interesting. And then in subsequent research at the FDR Library in Hyde Park, two major archives in New York, I kept coming up with, with letters from Pearl Buck. And that sort of inspired me to sort of begin to set aside a separate category of, of work on her that is not in, what thus far, not in the major Buck archives. And the idea now that I'm finishing up for research for the Olympian biography, my idea then is to sort of think about the prospect of writing a new biography of, of Pearl Buck. Now, uh, Lemkin and, and Pearl Buck are two very different people. They were born eight years apart, one near here, and Lemkin was born in Tsarist Russia. After World War I, um, that part of Russia became Poland. He then spends, so he spends the first 20 years of his life as a Russian Jew. The second 20 years of his life, he spends career-wise, educational-wise, in a country, Poland, that was somewhat anti-Semitic. And then, as the Nazis come into Poland in the fall of 1939, he flees first to Sweden, and then he's invited to come to the U.S. in 1941 at Duke University, near where I live, to teach at the law school. And then he, while he's, while he, and, and I'll, I'll get to that, that part of the story, which is seminal to the whole idea of genocide, but basically who was he? 
he coins the word genocide in 1944, and then after the war is over, and I'll get it more in depth into, into some of that, after the war is over, then he begins to push the United Nations to adopt a genocide convention, which they do in 1949. And one of the people who is absolutely integral to his success is going to be Pearl Buck. He comes to her in 1947 and says, uh, would you write the manifesto that I want to accompany my proposal to the UN to number one, declare genocide an international crime, and then once that happens, and I'll read to you from the manifesto and things like that, because what I, what I want to do today is principally read to you from the writings of Pearl Buck in this particular context. We know about her writing, we know about her voice in novels and so forth, but we don't know, what a lot of people don't know about is her voice as a, as a social and human rights activist, and this is particularly the case. And she works very closely with Lemkin because you can tell from some of her writings she's trying to explain to people the legal in and outs and of, of Lemkin's ideas about international criminal law. And you know that he's, he's telling her what to say in large part, not because she's not intelligent, but it's really the world of law is, very, is a world of grays and, and incomprehension. Now, to me, both Lemkin and Buck are refugees. Uh, she, sp she lived in China during one of the most, most unstable times in Chinese history. And I don't have time to go into that, but maybe in Q&A uh, I can address that more. He's born, as I've already said, in a very anti-Semitic country, Tsarist Russia, which was having horrible, horrible, was initiating horrible pogroms and persecutions of Jews. And so both of them, I think, in different sort of ways, bring that refugee sort of experience uh, to their lives once they come to the U.S. She settles, of course, in the, in the 30s. He doesn't come to the U.S. until 1941. Now, what, how does the, <clears throat> the other question I posed to myself was how, how do, do her and his wartime experiences, refugee experiences, affect their work? Um, one of her, I think one of her best novels is, you know, she wrote three novels about uh, the, the Sino-Japanese War from 1937 to 1945. Uh, the one to me that's most poignant is Dragon Seed, and I also think Dragon Seed is, is perhaps uh, one of her best novels. Uh, I would rate it up there with The Good Earth. The novel begins in 1937, months after Japan invaded China after the Marco Polo Bridge incident outside of Beijing. After quickly taking Beijing, the Japanese moved southward, taking Shanghai after a three-month campaign against Chiang Kai-shek's forces. They then moved westward to Nanjing. It's at this point that a peddler tells Ling Tang, Tang the principal character in Dragon City, that the East Ocean Dwarfs, the Japanese, had killed men, women, and children in the north. This is a hint of what is to come, though in the early chapters of Dragon City, Buck deals principally with the bucolic simplicity of life of Ling Tang's family. The suits changed as Japanese troops entered their village en route to Nanjing, and the village is just outside of Nanjing. At first, the villagers were only concerned about the flying ships that were bombing nearby Nanjing. Next came a flood of refugees followed by the Japanese. Before they arrived, Ling Tan called the villagers together, and they agreed that, being a defenseless village, they should greet the conquerors courteously. Heartened by Japanese leaflets that promised villagers had nothing to fear from them, their hopes soon turned to horror after watching Japanese soldiers attack village elder elders with their bayonets. More shocking was the mass rape of an elderly woman, a crime repeatedly discussed in the novel. Ling Sao, Ling Tan's wife, soon discovered after listening to the stories of many of the female refugees that the savage, brutal rape of Chinese women was commonplace in any area under Japanese control. Soon these distant crimes reached the village. After occupying it, the Japanese demanded that all of the female refugees who had fled to Tan's house had to come to them or suffer the consequences. After a lot of fear for soul searching, the refugee women went with the Japanese soldiers and became comfort women who were continually raped by Japanese soldiers. Ling Tan's family soon fell victim to these crimes after his daughter-in-law, Orchid, innocently ventured into Nanjing where she was gang raped and strangled to death by five Japanese soldiers. As conditions worsened, Ling Er, one of Ling Tan's sons, convinced the villagers to do what they could to resist the Japanese. This included refusing to grow certain crops and storing weapons for Chinese guerrillas in the nearby hills. 
The book ends in 1941 with Ling Tong and his family crushed by the weight of Japanese rule. All that remained in terms of hope was only a promise. Dragon Seed provided, uh, in a very poignant way, a full-scale view of the horror of Japanese crimes in, in, in China. Uh, estimates are that 14 to 16 million Chinese died under Japanese occupation, Jap Japanese occupation from 1937 to 1945. What was bold about her novel is the question of, of sexual crimes. Uh, and in the context of the Japanese, these were something we would not see later until Bosnia, which is using rape as a weapon of war to humiliate your enemy. Not so much, not so much just sex for sex sake, but, but deliberately pinpointing women as a means of humiliating the Chinese. And of course, we all know that face and humiliation is, is something very, very important in Asian cultures. Um, this was not limited to uh, it's not, these, these crimes are not limited to Asia. Um, estimates are that the Red Army, when they entered Germany in the early 1945, they raped about two million German women, so it's not something exclusive to that. The Japanese also did, like the Germans, medical experiments, and there's one incident where uh, they dropped uh, uh, rats infested with fleas and, become, and, and the plague over the Chinese village of Ningbo. So the Japanese, in terms of, of the nature of the criminality that she talks about, uh, it, it, it was fairly widespread. Now, um, Lemkins comes to the U.S. in 1941. Um, he teaches at Duke for a while, then he joins the rather bland government agency in Washington. And during his four-year period from 1941 to 1944, he had begun collecting Nazi occupation policy documents from friends in in countries occupied by the Germans. And in late 1944, he, he, he publishes a book called Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. And it's rather dull reading. I mean, if you want something to pick up and put on your bedside and put you to sleep in three minutes, Axis Rule is it. In chapter nine, in chapter nine, it's a very short chapter, he coins the phrase genocide, then he defines it. And of course, we hear that's a word we all are commonly familiar with. And, and for him, unfortunately, genocide, as he describes it, is you know, almost everything in war was, was genocide. He talks about biological genocide, cultural genocide, economic genocide, social genocide, so on and so forth. Now, his book comes out at the very time the U.S. is beginning to get serious about putting a war crimes to tribunal to get to, uh, together to try the German war criminals. Uh, at this point, the war with Japan is still suspected to be two or three years off. So it's basically dealing with Ch German war crimes. And so it's sort of a hot book around the Pentagon and in the, in the Justice Department and things like that because they're very taken, number one, by his detailed description of German occupation policies. And he described it with horror, the brutality and so forth. They still didn't know in depth, the, the information about the death camps and, and so forth is just beginning to trickle in. That's really not going to come in full face until the trial itself later that in 1945. But he sort of becomes a hot commodity to a point. Once the U.S. decides to decides to initiate an investigation and indict and try major German war criminals, then he gets a job with the War Crimes Office. Uh, it's something he felt was sort of beneath him in large part because he felt he should have a greater role. His principal role in all of this is he trying to convince the Allies to adopt genocide as a fifth charge in the indictment. They wouldn't do it. There were four basic charges, you know, war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, so on and so forth. Um, but he did work for the tribunal. He worked for Robert Jackson and Telford Taylor and people like that. But when the trial was over, he was very, very disgusted with the outcome. He was disillusioned. Part of it was ego, but part of it was the fact that he learned during this particular period that his beloved mother and father, as well as about 35 or 40 other uh, members of his family, had been murdered by the Nazis at, at Treblinka and Auschwitz. And this was really the stimulus for him to uh, then make his next move, which is to uh, go to New York. He actually moved there and stayed with friends because the new UN was meeting in Lake Success on Long Island. And um, so what we have is in the fall of 1947, uh, the UN is, is meeting. He has this idea that I'm going to sort of make a proposal 
to the UN to number one, declare genocide an international crime, but he's only got a few months to do it. He's got to convince delegates. Well, the person he turns to to do this was Pearl Buck, because by this time, of course, she was one of the most well-known people of letters in the U.S. She also had a track record of human rights, and uh, that I mean, it just she was one of the most vocal advocates of civil rights issues, human rights issues. I just mentioned that her, her response to the Japanese internment issue, so on and so forth. And so she was the most powerful person of letters in the U.S., I think, in terms of, of dealing this particular issue. So he writes to her. Uh, I don't know if they knew each other personally, but I know she knew about him because the New York Times, uh, the New York Post, all had letters on Lemkin and about the genocide issue and things like that, going back to 1944. So she knew of him and so forth. And I think from her perspective is this gave her a different type of stage because this is something going to take place before the United Nations. And there was this, United Nations was, it, understand that World War I, eight to 10 million people died, most of those are soldiers. World War II, 50 to 60 million people died, most of those are civilians. So there was this real effort among the not among all world powers, because uh, to address this horrendous, horrendous cost of civilian life in war, and so I think this gave her a new stage. And she was very humble about it. She was not. She did not have a an ego the size of this room. Lincoln did, but but it, she was willing to do almost anything he asked her. And the first thing he asked her, because he's got to submit this very small proposal to the United Nations to um, uh, consider declaring genocide an international crime. If they would do that, then you could go to the next stage, which would be to adopt a genocide convention, because this is what's happening in the post-World War. They want, to they want to take the Nuremberg decision, and they want to sort of codify that. They want to, they, they want to have, they're talking about the genocide convention. Uh, they want a declaration of human rights. So the, the horror of World War II is driving all these different proposals and so forth. He's sort of trying to f sort of weave his way in. And what better person to promote the issue for him is Pearl Buck. Now, uh, this is the letter she wrote for him. And it says, and she's talking about, the manifesto that she wrote stressed the urgency of such a convention given the recent genocide in Germany. This was merely an example of similar crimes in history. While the weak, the helpless, the innocent, whatever they, wherever they are, live in continuing fear. The strong, the ruthless, the arrogant can continue also unless and until the principles of human decency are transferred into international, international attitudes, statements, and laws, providing for the effective protection of the weak, the innocent, and the helpless against the strong and the ruthless. Life in our world is enriched by the diversity of cultures and ideas which proceed from variety in racial, national, and religious groups even as a community is the better for variety and its citizens. The destruction of variety would be an intolerable loss to mankind, and there is not guarantee, moreover, that the surviving groups or group would be the best ones. Homicide in a community is punishable by law, but genocide in the world community is still allowed, condoned, and sometimes rewarded. Yet genocide is a threat greater than war, for it is perpetuated in peace as well as war. It is contagious, spreading from one community to another, catching at fanatic fringes of the population and spreading like forest fire through fear. Indeed, in the last war, the victims of genocide were greater than the victims of war. We maintain that now is the crucial hour for establishing once and for all, everywhere in the world, a manifesto to remind mankind that human groups have the right to live in liberty and peace in accordance with other human individuals. Such free human groups, united by ethical, religious, and cultural ties, are a great living force in civilization. The concept of prevention of genocide envis envisages human groups in their organic entirety, including physical existence, biological continuity, and the basic elements of spiritual life. The protection of the spirit is as important as the protection of the body. The manifesto went on to say that the UN's adoption of this great and constructive principle would reassure a world divided by wars, misunderstandings, and uncertainties. It is the right of all human beings to live safely within the groups to which they have been born and to which they spiritually belong, and that the violation of this right, which is genocide, shall be held an international crime. 
Once the manifesto was completed, Lemkin then asked Buck to communicate with various world leaders. Now, this is a Nobel laureate and a Pulitzer Prize winner, so she had a stage. I've worked with Elie Wiesel and uh, Lech Wałęsa, so I've known, I know Nobel laureates, and particularly Elie Wiesel and I, we've talked a lot, of, well, he's passed away earlier this year. But there is, among, there is sort of a fraternity or sorority, whatever we want, of Nobel laureates. And so I uh, understand that in, in asking her to do this, she knows exactly, and it's interesting that in the group, in the people she approaches, is there are other Nobel laureates and things such as matter. Or, uh, and so then he, she sends, is exactly yes, she, she sends a series of letters uh, to some very, very prominent people internationally. Uh, and um, oftentimes these would be wires because time is their enemy. Uh, it's not like today where you can fax or email or stuff like that. Um, and these letters are absolutely, are absolutely fascinating. Um, one of the letters, one of the people she was in correspondence with, uh, as, as this process, by the way, the, the manifesto, the, the, the proposal is, is passed by the UN, uh, and they simply declare in late 1947 that, that genocide is a crime in international law, then, quit, then that sets the stage for him. Then. To, to, to propose, within the context of the UN, a genocide convention. And Lemkin will be on a group of three very prominent international lawyers that prepare a draft of a convention for the UN. And it's going to take from like late 1947 to late 1948 to get that passed. Now, the problem is, suddenly, once this is one thing to pass a statement saying genocide is an international crime. It's a totally different matter to suddenly put together a, a, a draft convention uh, and so what the next stage, the first stage was sort of easy. The next stage is very difficult because even the British and the Soviets oppose it because you get into, and understand, if you want to understand that, the dynamic of it, we, the United States, does not ratify the Genocide Convention until 1988. It's controversial because there are some things buried in it that, that countries can object to and so forth. So it's not, it's not easy peasy. It's going, well, he comes back to Pearl Buck and so forth. And one of the people the, that she writes is Zhang Tingfu, who's the newly appointed Chinese ambassador to the UN. It's interesting to go through the minutes of all these things to see how the Chinese are drawn into much of this discussion. She was deeply, deeply respected by the Chinese. And, um, and, and the Chinese are playing a very active role in this discussion because they're the quiet victim. You know, they, the, 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 the crimes of the Japanese in China don't get the attention that the crimes of the Germans in Europe got. And that's, that's a totally different story uh, that we could talk about later. But what I liked about the letter to her and then back to her was that he's, he's going to be the chair of the subcommittee that's going, to take, that's going to take Lemkin's draft and then sort of fine tune it and so forth and deal with the politics of passage. And she writes him and, and, and tried to seek his help congratulating him on his appointment. And he writes back, he says, China has been in the vanguard of those who desire to see at all cost a really living convention of genocide put into effect. He reminded her that though genocide was recognized and repudiated by all decent people, its prevention and punishment call for a careful and detailed definition of the crime so that nations or groups who would seek its preparation, perpetuation, could find no legal loophole of which to justify their, their acts. That's one of the most poignant statements ever made because that's the, that's, if there is a flaw in the genocide convention that's still in existence, it's the very thing uh, the Chinese ambassador was pointing to. Um, well, the other thing, and I'll sort of end with this because these are, these are, these are, sort, of, these are sort of interesting uh, letters. The last thing, because I have five minutes left, so the, um, the other thing, and, and again, this is simply to catch her voice. He asked her then, in early 1948, to write letters to prominent international international newspapers. Uh, one is to the Manchester Guardian. The other one is to Politiken, the, the Danish newspaper. In Manchester, the Guardian, as you might know, is one of the most liberal newspapers in the UK. Uh, Politiken is, is a Danish newspaper. And she very much was in touch with the Scandinavian countries because uh, Sweden had been neutral. Uh, Denmark had suffered from German occupation, but had been bold and had stood up to the, to the Germans in terms of saving their Jews and things like that. So Lemkin's very careful in who he has her right. Uh, but what she writes, I think, is, is, um, 
is very poignant. The letter to the Danes is shorter than the one to the Manchester Guardian, uh, but they're also an easier group to sell. The one to the Manchester Guardian is is a very different type of letter in large part because Sir Hartley Shawcross, who had been the British prosecutor at Nuremberg, was also the British representative at the UN on this discussion of the Genocide Convention. He vital, no, not vital, that's the wrong word. He staunchly opposed the Genocide Convention because he had been a prosecutor at Nuremberg. He said, look, we have the Nuremberg principles and we don't need another law or, or whatever. So I'll, I will read this letter, mainly because it captures her voice, and then I'll, then I'll stop. Her letter to the Manchester Guardian, he praised on the British for their sense of humil humanity and civilization, and said this was reflected in the fact that the head of the UK's delegation to the UN, Sir, Her Sir Hartley Shawcross, took the lead in 1946 to get the General Assembly to adopt Lincoln's genocide resolution. So she's turning the tables on Shawcross, who strongly opposed the convention, uh, and she's coming up face to face again against him, which is one very powerful person against a very another powerful person, and she's sort of trying to parlay this to the British. She reminded British leaders, not readers, not only of the genocide of the Jews during the Holocaust, but also the genocidal murder of thousands of Haitians in the Dominican Republic in the 1930s. Such crimes, whether during time of war or peace, were threats to humanity as a whole. A law against genocide, she went on, would have prevented Joachim, Joachim von Ribbentrop from serving as German ambassador to the UK while his company, country was persecuting the Jews. The same was true for the crimes of Enver Pasha, who walked the street of Tbilisi, Georgia, as a free man before his assassination. He was the head of the Turkish government that oversaw the genocide of about a million Armenians in World War I. She also restated, uh, a statement by a very prominent Norwegian uh, politician that a world full of distress and anxiety cannot wait for security until lawyers have made up their minds about large codifications of international law. This is sort of aimed at the legal community. She also pointed out the broad international support for the convention and noted that there was a large body of UN material in the UK. Uh, and I'll end with this. Um, it was ultimately passed in late 19, December 9, 1949. The Genocide Convention was voted into force. That's just passage. Then you've got to get it ratified, and that took another year. Um, she would nominate Lemkin, and she would join in the nomination 1949 of Lemkin for the Nobel Peace Prize, um, not knowing that as a Nobel laureate, the rule is you can't nominate somebody outside your field. So in 1958, when she nominated again, she by then had learned that she couldn't do it. But she told uh, Emmanuel Seller, who was the House of Representatives person who pushing for D Lincoln to get the Nobel Prize. He was nominated, Lincoln was nominated five times. She wrote to him and said she was sorry that she had since learned that she, she was not allowed to do that and so forth. So this is just a, this is just a glimpse of a much, much larger story that you know, is, is in this larger paper that uh, I find absolutely fascinating, and I think it presents, as I said, a different voice of Pearl Buck. Okay, thank you. Our next presenter, John McCabe. And John joins us from the Pearl S. Buck Writing Center. And then we'll have questions at the end. Good morning. We're having a wonderful time, aren't we? And uh, and, and dealing with a an international treasure. And I'm very honored to uh, speak about Pearl S. Buck and her work. And uh, I, I also have a great sense of of uh, the potential. You know, to the fact that she's not with us any longer could be eradicated. The fact that she's not with us any longer could be eradicated by what we're doing you know, and how we're bringing her back to, uh, particularly to youth and to diplomats throughout the world who certainly need her tools. You know. So uh, I, I'll begin as soon as I figure out how to work this. Okay. Uh, Pearl met with John F. Kennedy. He was among her audience. Her, her, her audience was humanity, and mine as well, 
and my purpose is to have written a book to change the course of nuclear weapons, as Rachel Carson changed the course of DDT by a book, one book. In Carson's case, her book was read by John F. Kennedy, and the impact began. In my case, I was ordered into a nuclear blast because of John F. Kennedy's diplomacy, while, he, while his brother, Robert Kennedy, looked on in Nevada that day from three miles back. In both cases, we send a passionate book to readers and hope for results. If the results were perfect, we would all see truth and ourselves as God sees us in that truth, as perhaps Pearl S. Buck gave us a glimpse of in Command of Morning. <clears throat> Uh, I just want you to know that rather strange things seem to happen as you go along in the, in the idea of being a writer, you know. And uh, I, I had a, a chance to visit the battlefield of Gettysburg, and I found myself on an open meadow. And the, in the battlefield of Gettysburg, you, there's numerous monuments, plaques. The, the place is virtually uh, graced, studded with those. And there were, this field was maybe 12 acres just natural grass, and there were no mon monuments and no statues. And I, it was one of our hot days that we've had, so I was looking for a place to get some shade, and, and I, the purpose was to rehearse this paper, you know, on, the ba on that battlefield. And I tripped over this uh, monument, and I just thought, my goodness, this is West Virginia infantry. <laughs> it just seemed rather odd, you know, so, and maybe something I should pay attention to. I've learned to pay attention to things in my life because you never know where the next inspiration is coming from. So we'll give some honor to the, to the infantry, okay? Uh, Pearl S. Buck, in her literary genius, all, always wrote to the global community about what matters most among the, ha the, the trappings and treasures of being human. With her deep insights into the Asian and Japanese worlds carefully restrained, she created the American novel, Command the Morning. We can, we, we can contend that this is an unhidden confession, exposing and condemning the atomic bomb. And uh, as a grave mistake, a runaway train of pride-induced government manipulations, a nonstop track of the Second World War's fear and malice and terribly misdirected science, according to Pearl. Pearl accomplishes this literary anti-establishment marvel within the pages of her 1959 Atomic Age novel. Had she not revealed the willful complicity of the scientists with a view to their simultaneous unity, their companionship, and singular purpose, they could have otherwise been held throughout the novel in utter disapproval. She wrote a scathing post-war II a narrative nevertheless but perhaps not equal in ferocity to what might have been portrayed had the bomb been developed and used by an enemy nation. If you're going to, if you're dealing with the atomic bombing of Japan, you had better be a scholar and maybe an angel, or don't even try. Pearl dealt with the atomic bomb and she expressed a contentious opinion. In her novel, and we can find clear evidence in support of that opinion. We're going to open our minds, please, by reading the excerpts, excuse me, by reading the ex excerpts from an Australian scholar, Paul Han, whom I found to reflect Pearl's opinions. First, in a 2014 Wall Street Journal book review, we read Mr. Ham's, we read that Mr. Ham's greatest sympathies are with ordinary Japanese. And, especially the young, victimized by a regime that demanded absolute obedience. And I'm now going to be quoting Paul Ham and a reporter in 2011. The old men in Tokyo knew they were defeated. Anyone who had half a brain in Japan at the time and were in positions of power knew they were defeated. What they were pushing for was a negotiated settlement. Of course, they were not going to get that. They were the aggressors. They had inflicted appalling atrocities against Asian people and prisoners of war. And they were not going to get a negotiated settlement of peace. They hoped for one, but they were not going to get it. 
The next question is, does that therefore justify the extermination of 100,000 people in an atomic holocaust or not? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. I mean, at what point is this bomb justified? And I find that the equation in many people's minds between the disgust of the Japanese military treatment of Chinese, Asian countries, and prisoners of war, if you accept that, and we all do, we have this revulsion towards that, that somehow we can't really sympathize with the Japanese victims of war, that they are somehow mutually exclusive. But you know, I think, and this is Paul Ham still speaking, but you know, I think that it's beholding on us to have a more profound understanding of these events, and perhaps a more transient sense of compassion. What the author, uh, Peter Kahn, in his book, The Pearl, uh, Pearl as Buck, A Cultural Biography, refers to indirectly as the wellspring of her own identity. Well, that well that, that she speaks of filled the world with an enormous inventory of information. We owe fame a debt as the enabler behind what we owe Pearl S. Buck for numerous contributions to the welfare of men. It can be said, and I heard, that if all, if we all saw ourselves as God sees us, we would be transformed. If an author brings us the truth, then that author presents what God sees because God is truth. So let's ask, is there a stark and shocking wonderful truth in what Molly, Pearl's fictional housewife character in Command the Morning, tells the reader? Pearl S. Buck spent much preparation and site visits to create her Atomic Age novel. As reported on the jacket cover of the novel, her fame gave her access to Oak Ridge and Los Alamos, talking with the men who worked on the atomic bomb. She amassed an insightful fiction and as always based it on events of true history. Pearl's arguments are like probes found repeatedly in her, we don't know, 70, 85 uh, plus published manuscripts and protected quotations. Pausing at one of her quotations Every great mistake has a halfway moment, a split second when it can be recalled and perhaps remedied. Here we found a place to start. Pearl had to be one of the first American writers to avoid the trappings of propaganda and atomic myth telling. Her novel's resolution message is found in the stark and cutting comments of one of her novel's non-scientific, non-political, and normally submissive characters, a predictably obedient and serving American housewife. Pearl brings forth in, that, in this character of the Lee Manhattan Project's director's wife, her author's nearly didactic counterargument on the atomic bomb, manufacturing and usage. This is the little girl who brought the west to the east and the east to the west. My qualifications. I have written a novel, a story born in Nevada that resurrects Hiroshima and Nagasaki under the title, Under Trees. Uh, I was ordered into the charge of the Light Brigade, but it wasn't 1854 in the Crimean War. It was 1962 in Nevada on the desert, and the light was nuclear. In Nevada in 1962, I was an infantry soldier and the government was detonating a weapon the exact same size as the one dropped on Nagasaki more than 17 years earlier. It was that very hot day under a blazing Nevada sun. <clears throat> to me now, the atomic bomb demonstrated was like the gripping matter of a confession. Not yet honestly, not yet told honestly, and not yet seeking absolution. I was forced to experience that first bomb through the lenses of pitch black glasses. The black safety goggles put each of us very effectively in this state of isolation. Entombed in the blackness of those sightless goggles, I was shocked by the huge sphere of boiling fire. It was as if the sun had exploded. It filled the lenses till there was no limitation to its mass or perimeter or to its blaze. Repulsive gray crusted formations like smoldering disfigured moons 
floated above the surface of that hell, all in strange orbits. No clear thinking was achieved while that jarring <coughs> nuclear imagery existed. My ears were pounded by a sound like the breaking of the universe as an implosive atomic bomb converted over 5,000 pounds of high explosive and a small sphere of enriched plutonium into a critical mass equivalent to 21,000 tons of TNT. The sound, that was, the sound was like that of a titan wielding an enormous sledgehammer, shattering with one fierce blow the very sun in the sky. Off in the distance, the sky crumbled in unending, deafening crescendos. The meteoric ball of fire was still an, an orange-red panoramic inferno when the black goggles and steel helmets crashed unheard to the ground as we tore them off, ordered to view the target with our own eyes. I stood agape at the proportions and energy of the billowing mushroom cloud that had already soared to 40,000 feet. That happens in seconds. I saw that the authorities among us were lunatics, and I see that now, but then I was only 19 years old, and I belonged to them by law. Five days later, unbeknownst to us, we would be exposed tactically to another atomic bomb. Most of us were all about 19 years old or 18. We were all teenagers. And that, again, this is 17 years after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. This time with no protective black glasses and no protection whatsoever. As we reached ground zero, I vividly remember jumping across rivulets of molten lava, black crusted, fire red, snake-like flows of nuclear infernos. And we, the American infantry, charged crazily across ground zero on foot in preparation for a possible invasion of Laos. These uh, guys were with me, and uh, we were all irradiated. The, uh, the, the radiological di diseases listed below uh, qualify for disability. Leukemia, multiple melanoma, lymphomas, liver, thyroid, breast, esophagus, stomach, pancreas, pharynx, small intestine, bile ducts, gallbladder, urinary tract, salivary glands. Here is a glimpse of perhaps what Miss Buck was thinking about when she covered the atomic bomb dropped in Japan in her fiction, Command in the Morning. In Hiroshima at 8.17, some people say 8.15 a.m., on a typically warm August morning, human agony that cannot be communicated in words shrieked at the universe. The Americans dropped an atomic bomb and people of all ages were instantly turned to carbon ash or burned beyond recognition. There were scorched skin hanging from their bodies in shreds. Some lost their sight immediately, horribly for others, their eyes melted the screams of, among the screams of the living and in the silence of the incinerated or the evaporated. Ten of the twelve schools in Hiroshima within a 1.3 kilometer radius of the hypocenter experienced 100% fatality. Most of the children suffered instant death, largely because they were still outdoors. Another 12,000 children, mostly 12 and 13 year olds, were at work clearing demolition sites to serve as fire breaks in the event of Allied incendiary bombing. They were also within the 1.3 kilometer radius. If any of them survived, they lived to witness flesh falling off their bodies and their workmates walking with their arms instinctively extended outward to reduce the pain. Among the general population, ground temperatures of 4,000 degrees Celsius were calculated. Iron melts at Celsius 1,535 degrees. The blast pressure was estimated to be 32 tons per square meter. 32 tons per square meter. The blast pressure was estimated to be that, and the approximate uh, wind speeds were 440 kilometers per second. That's 273 miles per hour per second. Caught up in these unimaginable forces, tens of thousands of Japanese were disemboweled, decapitated, their eyes blown from their sockets, their bodies crushed while unthinkable gamma and the most penetrating subatomic neutron rays saturated the city 
spreading unstoppable severe and fatal health problems to many of those who are astonishingly still alive. Children die in wars and they do so by the thousands. So let's do a synopsis of Pearl S. Buck's novel, Command the Morning. Command the Morning is a 1959 <coughs> unsettling story about contrition and of love <coughs> and of determination <coughs> and hope and contradiction of opinions involving the development of the atomic bomb. The characters are almost entirely men of science, backdrop by the militaristic planning of a fictionalized Manhattan project. The greatest contradiction is that of a non-scientific reaction to the project and its results by a wife and homemaker subjected to the chauvinistic male-dominated world of the nuclear scientists. This is a story of marriages and private lives that takes a revealing and intense route to Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Command in the Morning tells the human story behind the war years newspaper headlines and the historic drama of the atomic bomb. Science pursues the harnessing of an energy as great as the sun, while murderously hurling that discovery upon members of their own human race, thus propelling the, our planet into a frightening new era. The narrator grows deliberately weir the narrative grows deliberately wearisome as it sinks or swims in the lack of feministic freedom, with only one female scientist lead, Jane Earl, ironically the bearer of the female and male names. Jane and Earl, who happened to be professionally what the narrative cites as not possible in the 1940s, to be a top scientist in the field and a woman. She, the woman scientist, is never aligned totally with the males of the novel, nor the second lead, the female, Molly the housewife. The two females nevertheless make a stand independent of each other and with differing results. The male leads go on being suppressive in what they assume to be their world. The two lead females find conflict with the male's behavior and purposes and endless self-importance. Pearl S. Buck brings observations in, Pearl S. Buck brings observations in vividly naked language until something so poignant is skillfully revealed by one of them that may have seemed to be the least of her characters, the housewife. The housewife in the background speaks finally for all of humankind and the book ends on the strength of her judgment. It is quite probable that Pearl's command, The Morning, is among the bravest expressions of her feminist and humanitarian ambitions. That is to strike a critical blow to the military industrial complex in its cruel catastrophic pursuits in the rape and sale of the split atom. Fear, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Pearl Buck. Abraham Lincoln, 1864. Fearful of the influence of a powerful American military and its connections to power and industry and profits and corporation, Pearl Buck seems to echo Abraham Lincoln. Here's the Lincoln quote in the, in November 21st, 1864. It purports to say this. As a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow. And the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. I feel at this moment more anxiety for the safety of the country than ever before, even in the midst of war. God grant that my suspicions may prove groundless. Abraham Lincoln. Pearl S. Buck. Pearl S. This was the only picture I could find at the age she was when she did this. Pearl S. Buck in Washington, D.C. Pearl Buck in 1948, while battling against the UMT, the Universal Military Training Bill, before the Senate Armed Services Committee and the, and the peacetime draft, she expressed these sentiments. Never before in American history has the military establishment had so much money to spend, so many officers and or ex-officers in important civilian government posts, so much influence in the formulation of foreign policy for such an ambitious publicity department as, she do, as it does today. Pearl S. Buck 
and Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower's view of the use of view on using the atomic bomb. In 1945, Secretary of War Stimson visited my headquarters in Germany and informed me that our government was preparing to drop an atomic bomb on Japan. I was one of those who felt that these were that, that there were a number of cogent reasons to question the wisdom of such an act. During the resuscitation of the relevant facts. I had been conscious of a feeling of depression. And so I voiced to him my grave misgivings. First, on the basis of my belief that Japan was already defeated and that dropping the bomb was completely unnecessary. And second, because I thought that our country should avoid shocking world opinion by the use of a weapon whose employment was, I thought, no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. It was my belief that Japan was at that very moment seeking some way to surrender with a minimum loss of face. The secretary was deeply perturbed by my attitude, almost angrily refuting the reasons I gave for my quick decision. Conclusion. Command in the morning on page 281 of the, of the edition cited, Pearl completely concurs with Eisenhower when the voice of one of her characters, Dr. Zigni, a European scientist who escaped the fascist takeover, <clears throat> also states through logical argument and by providing evidence to the contrary that the need to invade Japan is unnecessary. And this is Pearl right out of the book. So Americans need not to invade. We need not to use the bomb. Dr. Signey speaking to one of the key nuclear scientists. You go to Washington, listen, Stephen. Here is something you must know first. I have just come from Washington. I have seen pictures of Japanese cities, photo reconnaissance. Never mind how I see them. The destruction is hell there. Our B-29 planes destroyed like, like hellfire. Strictly, Japan's Navy is nearly all destroyed. No ships left for use. Blockade both surface and underwater, and she must surrender. The people will demand it. The rulers cannot contain them. So America need not to invade. We, we, we need not to use the bomb. I swear it, Japan is already on her knees. We should remember that the, the epic final batteries, bat, battles before the expected invasion of the Japanese home islands were at Iwo Jima, 20,000 U.S. casualties. At Okinawa, 40, 45,000 U.S. casualties. Pearl Buck writing her historic fiction on the dropping of the atomic bomb is very easy to understand, if not didactic. Mm -hmm. Let us see what she had to teach us in her atomic bomb story. First, we can look into Pearl S. Buck's short story collection for consistency. Pearl clearly apprises her readers of her atom bomb sediments in the short story, Pleasant Evening, when her character, Mrs. Wilson, an older generation heartbroken mother of a dead prisoner of war, cuttingly questions the two young nuclear scientists in the story and compares them to the Nazis who used the we were only following orders excuse for the science for science arming the military industrial complex with the nuclear means to killing millions. Pleasant evening written after command in the morning confirmed the accusation, the accusatory proposition that Pearl S. Buck conveys in the novel. We, what could be more critical and clearly adversarial than Molly in Command in the Morning when she says, you used that bomb, all of you, because it was something you made and you couldn't bear not to use it. So you argued yourself into righteousness, but that doesn't make you righteous. This is the key of, the, of her uh, treatment of the atomic bomb through Molly. Molly saying to her husband, you used that bomb, all of you, because it was something you made and you couldn't bear not to use it. 
Thus did Pearl characterize the atomic era as well as its Manhattan Project origins succinctly in the final words of her character, Molly. The fact that Molly's words did not ratchet the literary world to bring sobriety to nuclear science and deep responses from public opinion is puzzling. At, 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 at this point, Molly, the wife of the leading scientist, Bert, Bert Hall, who is the Oppenheimer uh, character, uh, dealing with his day after syndromes of his guilt and his torment, the atomic bombs have been dropped on human beings and the recognizable pattern of his reproachful thinking has begun. But Bert's suppression of accountability has not yet broken into despair. He must, however, confront his wife, who up to this point was his total support in his career. Uh, real history gives an account Pearl must have or may have been referring to I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Voiced by the real head scientist, Pearl always connected fiction to fact, and when J. Robin Oppenheimer echoed from the Bhagavad Gita the final self-imposed sentence about becoming death via atomic science, Pearl condemns Bert to the same discovery. For well, this American writer, uh, to, pro to protest the trappings of propaganda and atomic myth-telling of the nuclear weapons industry is clearly what was known in the Kennedy legacy as a profile in courage. Her novel's resolution message is found in, in the stark and cunning comments of Molly, a non-scientific, non-political conclusion, and non-conforming. We should go back now to what present, present scholars say to, uh, that can coincide with Molly's claim. Uh, make this thing go back. Here is an excerpt from a very informative news interview in Australia. Australian Broadcasting Corporation, broadcast in October 2011. Reporter Ali Moore and an Australian scholar, Paul Ham, speaking on the scholars Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear history. I can't make this go back. There it is. Oops. Well, it's just as well for you to see this if we're running out of time. But, uh, it is why this is the, the interview. Now, now to our interview tonight is why we believe that the bombings of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the key events which ended the war in the Pacific in 1945. And the reporter asked, why write another account of it? Paul Ham, all the primary documents, a lot of them haven't been read as closely as I think they should have been. And certainly the ultra transcripts. These are the American intelligence systems which decoded Japanese cables, particularly between Japan and Moscow. So I felt as I was doing my preliminary research that this story hadn't been told in the way that it should have been. I feel that in many ways, certainly the military case for the bomb has been dis misrepresented quite substantially. I got this conviction as I progressed through the documents and found what was left out. Ali Moore. But I guess it wasn't just that. I mean, standard knowledge or standard thinking is that it was the bombs that brought the surrender of Japan. You would uh, uh, argue differently? Paul Ham, certainly. I would dismiss that. I would say the bombs were a contributing factor, but I wouldn't say that they were a decisive factor. Now the idea in the American nar narrative is that the bombs led to the prompt and unconditional surrender of Japan. But firstly, they didn't surrender unconditionally. The sole condition was the retention of the emperor, which the Americans accepted. Also, the idea that the bomb was a sort of, or had forced them, had forced them into submission, had shocked them into submission, was the expression they used in Washington. Well, it, it didn't shock them. In Tokyo, in Tokyo, they were prepared to go on fighting against the nuclear armed America. They were going to commit national sabuki, national suicide. In fact, the day of the dropping of the bomb in Nagasaki, there was a top meeting in Tokyo of the six warlords who ran the country there. And they were discussing not atomic bombs, but the Russian invasion of the Japanese occupied territory the day before. And run, a runner comes in and says, we've lost another city. Nagasaki has been destroyed. 
the, the samurai sort of said, thank you, and run along. And off he went, says Ali Moore, Paul Ham. Off, and yes, and off he went. And this was an extraordinary dismissal of the loss of another city. But the background, of course, is that the, at that point, Japan had already lost 67, 66 cities to conventional bombardment. And, uh, but, but what the, and Ali Moore says, but what they were aware of was that Russia had invaded Manchuria. Now Russia, they said, been trying for a long time to get Russia to act as a peacemaker. And, uh, uh, John, can we finish up so we can have questions? Okay, okay, good. What I, want, what I want to get to is the fact that the conversation between Paul Ham and Ali Moore leads to the point where she says to him, you mean they were going to drop the bomb because they made it? Which is the same thing Paul, Pearl Buck says in the novel. The same conclusion. There was no stopping the drop of the bomb, of the bombs. And uh, I think the point that is being made is that if we gave credit to who really won the war, the war was won by Allied and American soldiers, sailors, Air Force, Navy. The naval blockade was so effective, the Japanese were done for. The, the Russians were able to take the uh, Kwantung Japanese army on as if it was no resistance. Uh, and the, ja the Japanese did not want the Russians to invade Japan and they, because they didn't want communism in Japan. So they were ready to capitulate, surrender. The important point is this. If we as Americans believe endlessly, and I think Pearl was trying to tell us this, if we believe endlessly that the war was ended by two atomic bombs instead of the battles that, that, these, that our forces fought and died for, we credit too much to the nuclear weapon. And the Japanese weren't surrendering because of two atomic bombs. So that means we funded the atomic or nuclear war, I mean war preparation, to an absurd point. Had we said, you know, this war was won by our people, by our soldiers and Marines and sailors, it would have been, there would have been less runaway budgeting for the nuclear weapons, and you wouldn't be on a planet right now with 14 to 16,000 nuclear weapons you don't know what to do with. So I think Pearl was incredible because she discovered that the invasion of uh, Japan had been canceled. Truman canceled the invasion of Japan in July of 1945. The bombs were dropped in August. So there was something wrong with, and still remains with our belief that two bombs ended the war. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions, comments. So the, so the question is regarding uh, if there is uh, evidence or research related to Adolf Eichmann and Pearl's feelings on him being sentenced to death. The uh, Eichmann trial, Eichmann, as you know, was the, the, he was head of the transport. Uh, he was one that transported Jews. He was one that transported Jews from different parts of Europe to the various death camps. Uh, he escaped Argentina. He lived there. And then uh, the Israelis found him there in the late 50s. They kidnapped him in 1960, brought him back to Israel, indicted him for, for war crimes. I have the only set, probably one of the few sets of actual trial transcripts. I'm a, I'm a law school professor as well. And uh, in the War Crimes Genocide book, I did a, I did a lot with Eichmann, mainly because uh, it, was, uh, it was such a big trial in Israel. But it was also a very controversial trial. Uh, and so, I know I've not seen that, but it would fit into the storyline in large part because even in Israel, uh, because uh, Israel had no death penalty law. 
Uh, and there were a lot of Israeli jurists and lawyers who refused to serve on court. They said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do this because what you're doing is illegal. So her speaking out, I've not seen it, uh, but her speaking out would fit with the fact that in the legal community and among people like Pearl Buck, uh, it would be quite normal to have, because again, he was kidnapped, he was taken out of, out of somebody's country. In other words, what you want to do, I did a case, a new federal case last year in New York, um, in which uh, they, were, uh, they were trying to extradite a Russian art dealer who was living in New York, who had, who had gained control of a, an art piece after World War II that was stolen by the Nazis for the Germans. That's a totally different story. The way you do something like this is you, you, you go to the country like Argentina, you, you ask legally for that person's extradition, and then you present the body of evidence uh, to the government, and then they decide. So like in the case I worked on in New York, the federal court case, uh, we had to be very careful because if we, got, if we won the case, then Secretary Kerry had to sign off on it. So the Israelis didn't do that. Why? Because you had, Argentina during World War II was very pro-Nazi. One put her on and things like that. Uh, so the, it was very controversial because it brought in legal questions, ethical questions, and then it brought in the death penalty questions. The other thing is in law, there's a term, no law, no crime. There was no crime on the books at that particular time in Israel that would have, that would have allowed the Israelis to do what they did. So there were a lot of Israeli jurors, and so, she, so what you're saying to me would fit in my perspective. I've not seen anything on that, but I can probably find it. But uh, I, would, I would just say look at the New York Times or something like that. That's where you would find it. But, uh, and I've got the transcripts at home. I guess I'll go back now that you've raised it and look to see if anything had been said because it was an incredibly public trial. Mm -hmm. And it, got a, it was the trial in history that brought, brought the survivors out of the woodwork. And so the whole dynamic of discussing the Holocaust globally because the trial, you know, he was, it was being filmed and things like that. And it transforms the face of the Holocaust in the Western world in terms of it being, being something uh, that, that people were suddenly aware of. Because other than the Diary of Anne Frank, you know, people really did. Because the survivors in Israel, for example, they were shamed into being quiet. Because the Zionists who had founded Israel, when the survivors began showing up, why are you here? What do you mean? Why did you fight to the death? Because the Zionists had fought the British and the Palestinians for, for independence. And so it's a very complex sort of thing. So it's, but it, no, it fits right in. If that's what you've got, I would say that you're, that, that, that fits in with what she would have spoken out against, which would be the death penalty. I also remind people that the archives is not just her manuscripts. So we actually have a lot of her correspondence in the archives. And I'm guessing the Parole S. Buck International Center may also have some resources around there, so contacting our archives is completely online, so you can kind of search through what we have. So we may have some writings or evidence related to broader questions that people have around her work. Uh, other questions, comments? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I want to thank both of you for really wonderful presentations. I think they illustrate so well the efforts that Pearl Buck made on all fronts, whether it was through her activism or her writing of fiction to pull the attention of the public to the major issues of her time and to really kind of provoke a response from them. I think you illustrated that beautifully, as has the whole conference, really. Do I need to repeat that? OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'll echo it. Uh, so the, the comment was made that uh, the two presentations were very complimentary in speaking about her uh, sort of um, day-to-day -day writing or op-ed type writing, letter writing, campaign writing, actual helping legal uh, scholars write for social justice issues, particularly around genocide, uh, as well as then her fiction, also reiterating that point. And so, and that the conference has sort of brought those two kind of pieces of Pearl together to really integrate them as one. <coughs> I know that um, here she has a as an atomic bomb museum and a Nagasaki has a big park and has a huge statue of peace there. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering what you might comment on the Japanese sort of ongoing reaction to that, to the box. 
So the question is, if I can repeat that, that uh, is regarding the ongoing current Japanese uh, sentiment and feelings towards the bombings. Um, can the, okay, thank you. The, the Japanese people, in studying the Japanese people, uh, you, know, you find different, differing reactions. Uh, largely, I think the Japanese people hold this within themselves, you know, and you're, you're really not going to pick up on what, what their sentiments or feelings are easily. Uh, I think it's just a cultural thing, you know. Uh, but I, I have befriended a Japanese uh, diplomat from the UN, and actually he and I are, are working together uh, because they face the reality of uh, nuclear weapons in a way that none of the rest of us do. I mean, to some extent, us troops have had to deal with that. Uh, and the passion to rid the world of the threat of nuclear weapons is so strong among the Japanese that we should never underestimate their desire, their fervor to get rid of nuclear weapons. I've been in the company of, you know, I'm, I would say in Japanese, "Watashi wa American hibakusha," you know, which is I'm an Amer I'm a survivor of, of atomic bombs, and I've said that in, in the presence of Japanese survivors, and you've had people now coming to the United States and all over the world, speaking at peace groups, and we had them down at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and they continue to do this, uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, we're on, as I said, we're on a planet with 14 or 16,000 nuclear weapons that we have to deal with. And the Japanese have a great interest in trying to uh, apprise us of the dangers. You know, the nuclear reactor business in Japan is trying to thrive. You know, they really, you know, the, the industrial part of Japan, it, which Lincoln talked about, is building nuclear reactors and try to sell them to the world. But the people of Japan are extremely apprehensive about the whole threat. The threat from terrorists is so real. So what I found in, with Pearl S. Buck was that how in the world did she come up with the realization and the knowledge that an invasion of Japan was not necessary? And we have, well, my concern is and I was in the infantry, and I have great sympathy uh, and compassion for the men and women who fought these wars. But, and we have people now, they're, they're in, their, in their 90s, if they're still with us, who still believe that they're here because two bombs saved them from an invasion. Why don't all Americans know that Truman was not going to invade Japan? So we empowered the nuclear weapons industry. And the Japanese are, are, are baffled by that because they know a, a, a difference than we do. You know, we are convinced that uh, the best thing we did was meet the Russians and, and counter the, the, the other weapons holders in the world. Pearl was trying to tell us in a book that, that did not get the acclaim that it should have in 1959 that we were on the wrong track. So, my Japanese friend uh, is campaigning now to gather about a hundred scientists and medical people to really prepare us in the event of a nuclear uh, uh, terrorist attack. David, did you want to? I've been working on a project with Japanese and German can... scholars. Excuse me. For the last two years, I've been working on a project with Japanese and German scholars on. Um, the war crimes of the Japanese after World War II because one of the arguments, and, and this is not to contradict what you're saying, but some, some, some scholars will, would argue that the Japanese have hidden behind Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and, have, and, and because, as you know, MacArthur came in and essentially dictated the, the, the Constitution for the Japanese. And he was the one who, he in league with the State Department and the military decided not to try Hirohito and all that. Um, and so you have this peace constitution, and uh, as you said, it, it's been greatly internalized in, in Japanese history. The problem with it is that it has also led to the fact that the Japanese have 
essentially refused to acknowledge the war crimes they committed. And this is, in this number, you have all over East Asia, particularly with China, but in the Philippines, wherever, because the nature of Japanese war criminality in World War II was a much more personal thing. I mean, many of the crimes the Japanese committed in China were extremely personal. I mean, at least the Nazis, when they murdered people, they didn't want to deal with them directly, so they would have Poles or Ukrainians or Latvians leading people to gas chambers and things like that, whereas the crimes of the Japanese were extremely personal. And so it's, for example, the current Prime Minister, Abe, <coughs> He, because of the, what he perceives to be the growing threat of China, wants to move Jap Japan and change some of the constitution uh, so that J Japan can militarize more. It's a very controversial thing in, in, in Japan. Um, so it's a really, con I mean, but, but Japanese public opinion, as you said, is, is wholeheartedly behind the whole peace initiative. I mean, they would, they would, they would, they would stand in line to sign a petition to back Pearl Buck in terms of this. But it's a really complex issue, and it's something that's very contemporary. In other words, when we're dealing with the Japanese or the Filipinos or something like that, in terms of things going on in the South China Sea, every every time Japan gets involved, then it sort of kicks in those memories of World War II, and. Um, and, and so it's, it's a very contemporary, it's not a, it's not a dead issue, it's a very contemporary issue that still plagues that region. I do know, because I've had a lot of Japanese students over the years, and many of them, they have no idea, the educational system, they simply do not teach about any of the crimes or, or so forth. I mean, it's been the South Koreans have been to court uh, to, to, to address the issue of the comfort women. In China, that's an even more complex issue that I, I've written about, but. We don't have time for that synopsis. But it's, it's the, the whole, I, I guess what I'm saying ultimately is the whole dynamic of the issue of war crimes, nature of death, atomic ended bombs, things like that. It's a very different dynamic in Europe than in Asia. And in, in Asia, it's still a very alive thing that, that won't go away. One more quick question. It, it, it never comes up because Limpton, even though he was supported by many prominent Jewish, international domestic Jewish groups, he, he downplayed, his, he downplayed his, his Jewishness because he did not want that to become an issue because, you know, there was still a lot of resident anti-Semitism in the U.S. And some of the comments I, I've read from people who interact with him, I'm, I'm, I, I, in the back of my mind, I think that those are driven by the fact that he was a Polish Jew and he spoke with an accent and all this and that. Uh, but no, he himself did not play that up uh, because he did not want it to be a Jewish issue, even though everything he addressed in the Genocide Convention had principally been committed against the Jews by the Germans and their collaborators. Uh, Asia was never brought in on his side of it. Uh, and, that's another, and that's another thing, is that the war crimes trials are still going on. The trials in Japan did not begin until 46, and they don't end until the fall of 48. So, so that we, we still, and, and MacArthur would not allow the printing of the trial transcripts like they did in Nuremberg. They, at the end of the government, printed everything. And there was this big battle over the transcripts. So this is, there's a whole series of reasons why we never learned about the depth of Japanese criminality in World War II, say, unlike Germany. You know, that, that's another story. Thing, that okay, so, so I vote next conference, we put war in the middle, not at the end. We put the food one at the end. Um, but I do thank both of our presenters for, and our audience for tackling a, a tough issue. So thank you very much.